In section 12.3, we're going to discuss change of parameter and arc length. Just a brief disclaimer here that this is a significantly shortened excerpt of section 12.3 from the text. I just pulled several items out, but I'm not covering the full section um, that you see in the textbook. So I have a remark here to discuss what the arc length of a parametric curve is. If you recall from Calc 2, we've actually already seen this definition in two dimensions. We're now expanding it to three dimensions. So I'm going to assume that I'm working with a three-dimensional parametric curve um, in that we have the three parametric equations, x of t, y of t, z of t. And I'm also going to assume that I have a restriction on my t value. So I only am looking at a portion of that curve where t is ranging from a to b. If I want to find the arc length of that curve, look at what we're working with. On the inside of this integral is the distance formula with the derivatives involved. So how you can think of this is computing a small distance of a tangent line. And then our integral here is adding up all of these various pieces of tangent line to come up with an overarching arc length. Because remember, the integral is an underlying sum, if you think back to the Riemann sums. And so our definition here for arc length, or I should say our formula for arc length is, we're taking the integral from a to b of the square root of the sum of the squares of the derivatives, all with respect to t. Now we've seen this formula previously in two dimensions. If we are doing two dimensions, we're just gonna drop that dz dt term and only look at the x and y dimensions. So let's jump into a couple of examples here. Find the arc length of the parametric curve. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute the derivatives of each component function. So dx dt is gonna be a negative three sine t, dy dt, is going to be 3 cosine t. And then dz dt is the constant 4. Again, we are given a restriction on t. That's not something that we need to compute. That will always be given in the context of the problem. And so we're now ready to set up our integral. So we're going to integrate from 0 to pi. And then I want to take the square root of the sum of the derivative squared. So dx dt squared is going to be a 9 sine squared t, dy dt squared is a 9 cosine squared t, and dz dt squared is 16. All of this is being taken with respect to t. So if we look a little bit closer at the first two terms under the radical, I can factor a 9 out and I'm left with a sine squared t plus a cosine squared t. And so we recognize that to be the Pythagorean identity, that that is equal to 1. And so this integral collapses to the integral from 0 to pi of the square root of 9 plus 16, or 25. So in other words, I just get the integral of 5 dt. So this is 5t. And then applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, we get 5 times pi minus 0. And so for this one, we have an arc length of 5 pi units. So you'll notice whenever we're working with sines and cosines that Pythagorean identity is going to come in very handy in order to reduce multiple terms to fewer terms. Let's look at another example. And let's start out by computing the derivatives first. So beginning with dx dt here, I'm looking at this t squared term, so I get 2t. Let's take a look now at dy dt. So I'm focusing in on this term, y of t. Derivative of cosine goes to negative sine. But when I look a little bit closer at y of t, this second term is actually a product. So I'm going to apply the product rule. The derivative of t is 1, giving me just a sine of t and then t times the, the derivative of sine of t, which is cosine of t. So what we see is this plus and minus sign simplify, and we're left with just t cosine t. In the same vein, let's compute dz dt. The derivative of sine 
is cosine. And then apply the product rule yet again. The derivative of negative t is negative 1. Leave the cosine. And then the derivative of cosine is a negative sign. So there's my product rule. Yet again, the plus and minus cosine are going to cancel. I have a double negative here, which leaves me to a positive t sine t. So what started out as really complicated um, component functions here really simplified once we took that derivative. So now let's plug it all into the arc length formula. We have the integral from 0 to pi square root of each of these derivatives squared. So I get a 4t squared. I have a t squared cosine squared t and a t squared sine squared t. All of this is under the square root and the integral is taken with respect to t. So again, now we can factor out a common factor. I'm going to leave my 4t squared and then pull out this t squared. That'll leave me with a cosine squared t plus a sine squared t. Again, using that Pythagorean identity, we know that the term inside the parentheses goes to 0, or excuse me, goes to 1. And so we're left here with the integral from 0 to pi of 5t squared. Remember, the square root of x squared isn't just equal to x. It's equal to the absolute value of x. You can never get negative terms out. So if I want to simplify this, I can write this as the integral from 0 to pi of the square root of 5 times the absolute value of t. But look, if you look at your values for t, t is only ranging between 0 and pi. So as it turns out, those absolute values can be dropped. And now we're just integrating a linear function. So we get the square root of 5 over 2t squared from 0 to pi. The 0 term, of course, is going to vanish. And our final arc length is square root 5 over 2 pi squared units. So again, the takeaway here is that the arc length of the curve defined by r of t between the parameter values t equals 0 and t equals pi is the square root of 5 over 2 pi squared units. All right, so that was a quick overview of arc length um, in three dimensions. And we want to end this section by discussing change of parameter. All right, so we have a definition. A change of parameter in a vector valued function r of t is a substitution t equals g of tau that produces a new vector valued function r of g of tau, having the same graph as r of t, but possibly traced differently as the parameter tau increases. So an easy example to consider regarding change of parameter is, let's suppose you're driving in your car from home to campus. One day you might be in a really big hurry, and so you're gonna drive fairly quickly maybe a little bit over the speed limit. The next day you're more leisurely, you're jamming to your music and you're gonna drive slowly. Your direction or your path that you're gonna to take to campus isn't gonna change because you take the same path all the time. However, your parameterization has changed because now you're going more slowly. So it's gonna take a longer unit of time to get from your starting point to your ending point because of your change in parameter. So this is what we're working with here, supposing that we're changing parameter and we're switching in this case from parameter t to a parameter tau. What we would like to understand is how to perform calculus on these functions when we've changed parameter. And because we have a composition function, naturally it leads us to the chain rule. So theorem one is just the chain rule for vector valued functions. It says let r of t be a vector valued function in either two or three dimensions that is differentiable with respect to t. If t equals g of tau is a change of parameter, which we just defined, in which g is differentiable with respect to tau, then the composition r of g of tau is also differentiable with respect to tau and is given by the following formula. So what we have is the derivative of r with respect to tau, not t, but tau, 
is dr dt times dt d tau. So you'll notice this is where Leibniz notation is so useful because you can really see it happening here with these dt's on top. Now we're not physically canceling these out, but notationally that's exactly what's happening. All right, so let's put the chain rule to use here. We wanna calculate dr d tau by the chain rule for the given vector valued function and the given change of parameter. And then we also wanna check our work by directly substituting in one over tau for t and then differentiating with respect to tau. So let's look at this first by computing dr dt. So however you wanna to note that here. So dr dt is going to be 0 in the i hat plus 9 halves t to the 1 half in the j hat and 1 in the k hat. All right, so here's our dr dt. And then we can also compute dt d tau. So if we think of t as tau to the negative 1, then we get negative tau to the negative 2, or if you want, negative 1 over tau squared. And I'm going to label this with a 1. This is going to be method 1. All right, so pulling this together, our chain rule says the following dr d tau is dr dt times dt d tau, which is 0, 9 halves t to the 1 half, 1, times a negative 1 over tau squared. Now, I want my final answer in terms of tau. So wherever I see a t, I need to replace it with the change of parameter 1 over tau. So keeping that in mind, I have 0, 9 halves of 1 over tau to the 1 half, 1. And then I'm scaling this by a negative 1 over tau squared. So once I simplify everything, what I'm getting here is 0. 9 halves, and I'm going to combine, let's see, this is negative. I'm going to combine these. I have a tau to the negative 1 half and a tau to the negative 2, so that becomes a tau to the negative 5 halves. And then at keeping with this negative exponent, I'm going to keep it as a tau to the negative 2 here. All right, so this is my answer for dr d tau following the chain rule. Next, we would like to ensure that we have the correct answer by doing it the old-fashioned way. So I'm going to now find r of tau, not the derivative, but just taking the original vector valued function r, and wherever I see a t, replacing it with 1 over tau. So I'm going to write this as i hat plus 3, I'm going to write it as a tau inverse to the 3 halves j hat plus tau inverse k hat. All right, now I have completely eliminated the parameter t, switched everything to tau, and now I can find dr d tau directly without needing any kind of a chain rule. So derivative of 1 is 0. Um, let me do one introductory step here and write this as a tau to the negative 3 halves. And I'll do that in the next step. And then this is, uh, via the general power rule, a negative tau to the negative 2. And so finishing off that middle step here, we have 0, negative 9 halves, tau to the negative 5 halves, and a negative tau to the negative 2. And so we look back up at what we have, and sure enough, that matches doing it directly. 
Now, upon first glance, when you're looking at these two methods, you might say, well, what the heck? Method two was so much quicker. Why wouldn't we do that every time? In this particular example, solving for DRD tau directly by means of substituting first is simpler. That is because our change of parameter, t equals one over tau, was a simple change of parameters. Had it been significantly more complicated, then the chain rule would have been much more beneficial. It's just not, hard, it's just not easy to see in this particular example. All right, and that's it for our notes on section 12.3, arc length and change of parameter.